Okay, welcome everyone to another online edition from Hibiscus Coast Astronomical Society and uh, a very big welcome to all of our special guests today and especially to Space Dave, uh, someone I've been uh, waiting to meet for a while now. So uh, glad you're here, uh, Dave. Uh, welcome. Um, so no, not a whole bunch uh, in some general news on my side. Um, We'll be kicking off with Josh, who will be giving us what's up in space news, um, and then we'll move straight over to Dave. So I think over to you, Josh. Okay, thanks, James. Just to share my screen. Um, cool. Yeah, so we'll start by going over what's been happening in astronomy recently, what's been happening in the sky above us. Uh, so, of course, the big space news that's been covering the media these last few weeks is about the uh, NASA's Hubble successor, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, let's see if I can get this out of the way. Um, move that down here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the James Webb Space Telescope, what is it? Well, construction started on the James Webb back in 2004 but it's suffered countless cost and schedule issues leading to many delays. So this is one thing that you may have heard us mention during the astronomy news in previous meetings, you know, oh, there's been another delay, it's been pushed out again. But finally, after all these delays and back and forth, it's, it's finally launched. And it launched on Christmas day in the US. And the mirrors have now been unfolded, deployed successfully, and it has now uh, arrived at the spot where it'll spend most of its time, 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. So if you're new to all this, you might've heard about the James Webb and you're wondering, well, what's the big deal? So what's different about the James Webb compared to the Hubble? Well, for starters, the mirror size. So the Hubble is a 2.4 meter mirror area in total, whereas the James Webb has a whopping 6.5. And of course, as we all know, when it comes to, uh, to telescopes, the bigger the mirror, it, it makes all the difference. You know? And um, some of the other differences are in terms of the observation, the Hubble mainly looks at the optical and ultraviolet. So optical, it means it sees what our eyes see, and it, it can also do some observing in the ultraviolet uh, range as well. It can also do infrared, but primarily optical and ultraviolet. Whereas the James Webb is mostly going to be looking at infrared. And the reason for that is that um, when we look out in, into the uh, night sky and we look at the stars and everything that's out there, what we're seeing is really, really far away. And uh, because of the um, expansion of the universe, you know, things are moving away from our viewpoint. And when things move away from us very quickly, they get a red shift, they are more visible in the infrared part of the spectrum rather than the other part of the spectrum. And so the James Webb Space Telescope uh, in particular, we want to use that to kind of try to look back through time and understand more about the formation of the galaxy of, you know, that kind of early era of space. And so that's why it's going to be looking, uh, 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 it's going to be focusing primarily in that infrared wavelength. And one of the other differences is the orbit. The Hubble is, is quite close to Earth, whereas the James Webb is at a Lagrange point, which is L2. If you're not sure what all that's about, when we talk about the uh, out in space and, and the Earth kind of revolving around the sun, um, when, when it comes to orbital dynamics and how things move, it can get really, really complex. But one of the really weird things about orbits is that in any particular orbit where you have one object rotating around another big object, you get these things called Lagrange points. And the way it works is if something is at one of these points, it can kind of remain in a stable orbit, so to speak. So um, you may have heard in the news people talk about the, the James Webb Space Telescope. It's currently parked at Lagrange point L2. And that doesn't mean that it's turned off all the engines. It still needs some power. It is doing a bit of an orbit, but it means that over here in L2, it doesn't have to use that much uh, power and fuel to, to kind of stay there. 
And um, so this difference is quite key because the Hubble, because it's close to Earth, it means if it breaks down, it needs more repairs or fuel. It's relatively easy for us to send a mission up there to service it. Whereas uh, James Webb at the Lagrange point, it's so far away, it means that refueling this is gonna be quite a mission. So initially it was planned with enough fuel to uh, hopefully last for uh, 10 to 20 years, depending on how well the trip out to the L2 went. Because if they ended up using a lot of fuel in that trip, well, you know, they'll only have uh, enough left for 10 years. But fortunately, the trip went very smoothly. So now they're estimating there should be enough fuel for the James Webb Telescope to operate for 20 years, which is really good news. So yeah, just keep an eye out on the space news coming up and uh, hopefully it won't be too long before we start hearing some of the findings from the James Webb Space Telescope. So also in the news, a new mystery transient discovered within our galaxy. So there are all kinds of weird and strange things in space. You know, you've got planets, stars, and then there are things called transients. And sometimes when a star dies, it can sometimes create a, uh, something that we call a transient. And we call it that because it, it doesn't last for a long time. It's kind of there and then it goes away. So there are different types of transients. There are slow transients like a supernova and a slow one, it might brighten for a few days, then disappear after a few months or could take longer. Whereas a fast transient like a pulsar is something that, uh, that, that flashes extremely quickly within milliseconds or seconds so pulsars are things that release these bursts of energy or radio waves, you know, once every uh, few milliseconds or seconds. So those are the types of transients we know about. But what's interesting is that we've now found a transient within our galaxy that blinks on for one minute and then off for 18 minutes and then on again for one minute and then off again. And we've never discovered anything like this. We, we know about the slow ones and we know about the fast ones, but this is the first time we've found one that's kind of in between. So yeah, we, we, we're not really sure what this, this new object is. And we were able to observe this for around three months of data, but now it's disappeared. It's gone for good. So scientists are very keen to keep observing to see, can we find something else like this so that we can work out, was this just some weird one-off or is this a whole new type of, you know, a, a pulsar or a, a whole new type of object that we've never discovered before? And there's actually heaps of them out there. So we'll keep looking to the, to the skies for that one. So also scientists develop an Apollo can opener to open a 50 year old canister of moon dust. So uh, back in the Apollo missions of the 1960s and 70s, we went to the moon, we collected a lot of lunar samples and over 2,200 lunar samples were collected uh, during that time. And at that time, scientists had the foresight to know, okay, in the future, we're going to have more technology than we do now. And we'll be able to understand this stuff more. So let's not open all of the samples right away. Let's, let's put a sample aside for 50 years and then we'll open it with, you know, with the better technology we have. And so um, in one of these particular missions, in the 1972 mission, a lunar soil core sample was sealed in a vacuum type container while on the moon. So the container was actually kind of closed on the moon, meaning that container is trapped in all of the, the lunar gases. You know, we often think of the moon as having no atmosphere, but there, there are some, there's some stuff there. And so now uh, the ESA, the, the European Space Agency, they spent 16 months developing this special gadget, which they nicknamed the Apollo can opener, and this gadget is designed, specially designed to pierce this cylinder that's been sitting there for 50 years, uh, to pierce it in such a way that we can collect the lunar gases and study them and also look at the soil sample. So yeah, be uh, a long time coming, but we'll finally get to open this one. And first movie studio in space is going to be developed for Tom Cruise's upcoming space movie. So this is about uh, an organization in the US called Axiom Space, and they've been commissioned by a movie studio company to build an inflatable module for the International Space Station. And this module is gonna contain a production studio and a sports arena 
And apparently it's all gonna be done by 2024. This is an artist's impression of what it could look like. This is the new module here. It's like a giant golf ball. So we've got the International Space Station and uh, obviously these, these modules are designed in such a way they can kind of you know, plug in. So this is apparently what this one's going to look like. It will be six meters in diameter and will be uh, able to host films, TV, music, and sports events. The six meters doesn't sound like a lot of space. I don't know what kind of sports events you can fit in there, but it will be quite exciting to actually uh, see content you know, delivered from space. And the plan for this module is it's gonna dock with Axiom's commercial section of the ISS. It was also planned for 2024. So Axiom plans to build their whole, uh, the whole kind of custom section that's gonna plug into the ISS. And then this new movie studio is gonna kind of plug into that. Um, and yeah, all of this is for an upcoming movie. We don't know the details about the movie yet. We know that Tom Cruise is gonna be in it. We don't know what it's gonna be called but it's going to be apparently the first action movie uh, shot in space or with, with key scenes shot in space. And so this, this module is for that. And finally in the news to, to wrap things up, the Pentagon launches a new office to study UFOs. So this is uh, the new Unidentified Aerial Phenomena program and its purpose is to investigate UFO sightings. And you might think, well, this is kind of weird. Why would the Pentagon uh, be taking interest in that? Uh, but the US military has said that their interest in it is they want to look into these things just to make sure that it's not actually some advanced ship from Russia or China or that kind of thing. So uh, the US military says their interest is purely in uh, to be able to detect, identify and assess threats to national security. So in order to do this, they're, 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 they want to look into these sightings, you know, to make sure that there's, there's nothing else there. But you know, long time UFO enthusiasts are quite skeptical. A lot of people out there say that the US government knows that there's aliens and they're keeping quiet about it. So with this recent news, a lot of these people are saying, ah, yeah, but they're still just gonna keep secrets. You know, They're gonna say, look, we're telling you everything, but really not tell us anything. So yeah, we'll wait and see uh, what, what comes of this and whether they officially recognize any of these unidentified aerial phenomena as aliens. And that wraps up the astronomy news uh, for today. So I will pass this back to James for now. Uh, thanks, Josh. Yeah. Space web, uh, so far so good. I'm uh, really looking forward to what's going on there. Exciting. Uh, so some other interesting things um, that I, I read recently is that uh, China and uh, Russia are now going to collaborate on the lunar habitat, uh, which is going to be an interesting one. Um, of course, there's a big race to see who's going to be the first people to build this habitat on, on the moon. Uh, of course, NASA's planning on it. and a couple of the private space companies are planning that as well. But I was just thinking in terms of the ISS, um, you know, if all these companies are going to do these uh, sort of add-ons to it, it's going to end up looking like a, like a Tetris <laughs> thing. Or, you know, I think, you know, sort of if, we, if we go up in a hundred years time, is it going to just be this mishmash conglomeration that's called the International Space Station. Yeah, well, I mean, that's if it's even around, because there are plans at, at some stage in future to decommission the ISS. And so I think that's why, that's one of the reasons why Axiom is building their own part to it. So if the ISS is decommissioned or whatever, Axiom can continue to run that as a standalone thing, or maybe that can plug into, I don't know, the successor to ISS, something like that. So they're already planning you know, uh, what if this doesn't live on the ISIS? All that I, think, I think there's five or six different companies right now that are talking about building their own space station. Mm. Uh, some of them more ambitious uh, than others. But yeah, it's going to be interesting <laughs> the next couple of years, seeing what goes up there and what stays up there mm. and what we do up there. Because yeah, I think the, one of the ones which they say is going to be up there also quite soon, there's a space hotel. <laughs> so <laughs> that's going to be an interesting one. I wonder how much it'll cost for a room. <laughs> mm. 
Okay, um, so I'm going to hand over to Dave now. Um, uh, Dave is uh, quite an interesting person. Uh, he's from uh, the Ta'awamutu um, Space Centre, I think it's called. Um, so he's been involved uh, in education and uh, teaching sort of the public about space um, and astronomy and uh, you know, he's used this this whole passion, um, of course, to build the Space Centre, which uh, is yeah, pretty close to Hamilton, runs uh, on occasion with uh, Hamilton Observatory, uh, also works closely with Hamilton Astronomical Society. And uh, if you want to find out more about Dave, uh, I have posted a number of links here. Uh, he's on Facebook, YouTube, you name it, he's there. I'm sure you'll let us know. Uh, of uh, a few other places that he's at. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dave. I think um, if you want to see Dave full screen, because he's not going to be using the presentations like Josh, I think if you just double click on him. Um, I'm not sure. If how. I can button there, I think uh, it has been a while since I've done this, but if you look at the top right of there your window and you'll see yeah. a a view button. I'm pretty sure you want to be on speaker view if you're not already. Um, so that will show you uh, whoever is talking at the moment, um, sort of big and almost full screen. So uh, hopefully uh, that makes sense to you. Okay. Um, also, uh, what you can do is um, if you want to ask a question, uh, if you just pop it into the chat, um, I'll be able to look at the chat. Um, I see Nathaniel says hello as well. I'll be looking at the chat, Dave will be looking at the chat, uh, or we will be having a question and answer right at the end, I, I would imagine. Uh, Glenn O'Leary says, view works fine, thanks Dave. Okay, without further ado, all over to you, Dave. Uh, thank you very much, James and Josh and uh, everyone else. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your meeting tonight. It's really awesome to be here. So, um, uh, yep, what, what I'm planning to do tonight is um, I thought I would just give a, a fairly brief overview at the start of what happens at the Space Centre and what it's all about. Um, and then I want to have plenty of time to talk about some projects that I've been working on over the last couple of years uh, in response to the current world situation and how that's all panned out, because obviously everything has changed a lot. Um, so I'm just hoping that everyone is seeing me nice and big. If you're having any trouble, um, feel free to ask for help, but hopefully that putting it on speaker view will sort that out for you. Um, now, um, I am happy to take questions as we go. So do feel free to pop your questions into the chat. Um, if not, there should be uh, plenty of time at the end uh, anyway. Now, one thing I did forget to ask you guys before we started is, uh, when do you want me to finish? Uh, how long is this supposed to go for? Because I'll talk all night if someone doesn't stop me. I'll be quite happy for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's dangerous, because seriously, I will go all night. Um, okay, I, I can't see anyone's video at the moment, really, other than Ian. Uh, if I see Ian starting to nod off and uh, go to sleep, <laughs> then I'll know that it's time to wrap it up. Uh, but um, yeah, anyway, let's just sort of get stuck into it. Now, before I start with anything else, I really um, do need to make sure that I remember to do a bit of a shout out to uh, Hamilton Observatory and Hamilton Astronomical Society. Um, so yeah, big shout out to them. This is Hamilton Observatory uh, by the zoo in Hamilton. Uh, you can find Hamilton Astronomical Society online. Uh, here's their website, has.org.nz. Uh, you can find them on Facebook. Ian does a lot of the Facebook work uh, there. Um, it's a cool sort of a medium-sized observatory. Um, it's got, got some nice equipment there, including um, the 24-inch Cassegrain up in the uh, dome there. There's a slightly wider view uh, of the dome. So yeah, we, we definitely love to see you at the observatory sometime. Okay, so um, a bit of an overview of the Space Centre here. So uh, if we have a look at a map, basically, if you're coming from a north, you're just following State Highway 3. You come down to Hamilton. It's about half an hour south of Hamilton. 
Uh, you go through the town of Te Aumutu and we're just a, a couple of kilometers south of that. So we're actually on State Highway 3, so we shouldn't be too hard to find. This is what it looks like from the outside. Uh, these photos that I'm going to show you are a little bit old, but uh, give you the picture. Now, it's just a, a small building. Uh, it doesn't look like much from the outside, frankly, um, but I sort of play on that a little bit and I try and make the inside look a, a bit more interesting. Uh, I'm going to show you a live shot, actually. This is a, a camera in the main room where I am now. In fact, if I wave out, hopefully you can see me over there. This is where I am right now. So that kind of gives you a bit of a picture of the main room that we're in. Uh, behind me over there is a shop area. We've got a couple of little rooms in there and there's a couple of other rooms out the back, one out that way. Um, but this is sort of, uh, the main little room that we're in. It's about 200 square meters, I think, or something in the main part here. Um, now, this photo shows you uh, what it would look like in a sort of a reasonably typical uh, weekend day or day during the school holidays. So on these days, it's just open to the public. We recommend that you book ahead if you can, although we are happy to take walk-ins if we can fit you. Uh, so people just come along, they pay their money, you walk around, you have a look at the stuff and uh, you do the activities. There's quite a bit going on even in, in this picture. Um, some people are having a go on the interactive things. Uh, you can see there's quite a bit of uh, printed information on the walls. There's some people trying the virtual reality headsets there. It's a, a simple 10 minute show that makes you feel like you're in space. Um, the kids are doing their written activities. In fact, uh, as you go around here, you can uh, do various challenges, you earn points and you can get yourself um, a badge with your astronaut wings like this. You start off as a cadet and you work your way up. So there's uh, activities for all ages. It's definitely suitable for all ages and that's quite an important part of uh, what we do here. Um, School groups, uh, we did them a lot before COVID. Um, traditionally, especially during term two and three, we would expect to have school groups here uh, basically every day. But uh, like so many things, that all changed with COVID. Uh, we do uh, some evening sessions, haven't done any for quite a while, but general group bookings, sometimes we might have a guest speaker, that sort of thing. Uh, we do kids' birthday parties, uh, other, you know, just things like that. Basically, we'll book the place out to anyone who's prepared to part with a little bit of cash to come along, um, and we build the whole space thing into it. Uh, so uh, that's kind of... The, the main sort of target markets we have. We're basically trying to appeal to everyone we can. In terms of what we've got here uh, to look at, I guess the heart of the whole thing uh, would be the collection, um, the, the physical collection of things. So this is uh, just my personal private uh, space collection. Um, uh, I've got some quite cool stuff. It's not a huge collection. I mean, if you compared my collection to some of the really serious wealthy collectors overseas, it, it doesn't really hold up that well. Um, but I've got some pretty cool stuff, um, you know, real things that have been in space. So there's, there's quite a bit to look at here. Uh, you can see bits of space suits and stuff like that. Um, lots of uh, models and sort of other just sort of related displays and things like that. And the idea would be that, um, for example, with the Saturn V along there, you can't see it very well, but above that, there's sort of explanations of how it works, how the stages separate and all that kind of stuff. So you're seeing things and uh, ideally learning stuff as you go. Uh, most of the collection here is sort of generally related to space flight, um, but, but I've got a, a bit of other stuff as well, some nice historical old books and instruments and things like that. Uh, so the, yeah, the collection is sort of the original foundation of the whole project here. But in fact, if you're coming for a visit, it, it certainly, it would be probably less than half of your time here would actually be just looking at the things here. There's lots of other stuff to do as well. And I'll quickly go over a couple of them. Um, We've got a lot of computer screens here. I think I've got about uh, 35 or something uh, screens at the moment, um, just displaying various things. And a big part of that is uh, these uh, live feeds of some sort. So in this case, we are seeing some um, views of the sun. Um, so these are the latest images coming in from the sun. And we've got other screens dedicated to uh, earth science um, and just, uh, well, actually, what have we got? Uh, well, the um, International Space Station, of course. We've got the uh, tracking map showing you where the station is now. Uh, both of the main live video feeds coming from the station uh, with all the information that goes with it. Uh, there's actually a um, that smaller screen in the middle is uh, the SpaceX construction facility. Uh, so you can see what they're up to. There's always interesting stuff going on there. So uh, these live feeds, that's quite important. I'm gonna come back to them later. 
Um, but we've also got a lot of interactive screens. So these computers, for example, you sit down in front of them and they've all got uh, keypads in front of them. You press buttons and you make things happen. Um, what we've got there, there's uh, a, a lunar landing simulator. So you've got to try and um, control your thrust to land on the moon. There's a quiz. Uh, I've actually got a Stellarium one there. It's just showing Stellarium with a keypad so that you can move around and see what's uh, happening in the sky um, and a few other bits and pieces there. So um, th that's really popular, the interactive stuff. Uh, people can spend quite a lot of time on that. Um, it, it's a bit of a double-edged sword for me, the interactive stuff. Um, they are really popular. They work really well, but they are quite a headache and expensive to um, make and maintain. So um, I'd never be without them. But if you're considering setting up something like this um, in your own facility, uh, just think carefully about what you're getting yourself in for here, because people are absolutely brutal with this stuff. You'll get kids coming along and thinking it's a drum kit and start bashing all over it. So, uh, but it's worth it. The, the interactive stuff uh, really, really does go very well. So if you're looking around here, these are the main sort of things. I think you get the idea of the sort of things that you can um, look at while you're here. Um, I will quickly just mention that we have a shop um, and uh, you may well recognize uh, Astrons. So we, we uh, sell Astrons telescopes and binoculars and a few other brands. The bad news is um, I have actually decided to uh, close down the shop. That was a really, really difficult decision to make. Uh, so unfortunately, all the stock is dwindling away behind me. Um, I will continue to support Astrons, absolutely, and I'm keeping a range of telescopes here so that we can keep doing our evening sessions, but instead of selling the telescopes myself, I will just point people at the Astrons uh, website and tell them to get in touch with Andrew. Um, so I think, um, let's just go back and have a look at a live shot. You can sort of see the, the basic layout and what you do. So you come here and you, um, actually I should point out that sort of, um, my little drawing thing here is sort of down there and sort of behind there along that way is sort of um, a chronological story of space flight and it goes off into the back room there on this side of it um, it's more about astronomy and um, where everything fits in the universe and that kind of stuff so there's a, a kind of a flow through it so as you move around um, you sort of see the progression of everything uh, so uh, if you've got any questions about what we do here at the Space Centre and how it all works, I'm more than happy to take questions, um, but I don't want to dwell too long on that because um, we don't want to be going all night. Uh, and I do want to talk about some of these other projects because, as you can imagine, when COVID hit, uh, it was a complete disaster for everyone and we didn't escape that. So this place doesn't get any kind of public funding at all. Uh, sorry, we, we did get um, the relief money for COVID, but um, under normal circumstances, the entire place is completely self-funded. So when COVID hit, our income dropped 100%. We, we just lost all of our income in one go. So it's just, it's been um, a difficult couple of years, as you can imagine. The good news is that um, I have a background in doing work online. In fact, that was what originally um, funded this whole place was my work doing websites. Uh, I built a series of websites that make money and um, that's sort of how I got all this going. So the obvious thing to do was to fall back on doing my online work, at least when we were in lockdown. Uh, what I've actually found is that even when we haven't been in lockdown, uh, I think we had one really good school holiday after the first lockdown, but that was it. It just has not come back. All of the school groups have just stopped. I, I don't think we've had, I think we might've had two or three school groups in the last two years. Um, all of the rest homes, the scout groups, the churches, you name it, none of them want to do group bookings anymore. So um, it, it's just been uh, <laughs> a nightmare. Uh, so anyway, as I say, it's not all bad news. I did have some other options. Um, so what I want to do is I, I want to go through some of these. I want to show you uh, and talk a little bit about some of the projects that I've done. Um, and I'll just quickly uh, show you what I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, so these are the four main areas that um, sort of seem to be the obvious things to work on. Um, social media, Zoom sessions, website resources, and a, a thing that I want to talk a bit about, uh, the thing I'm calling the universe monitor. Now, I'm not actually going to talk much about social media unless people have got lots of questions about it, 
because it's fairly self-explanatory and uh, most of you guys know how social media works it's it's, it's pretty obvious and, and I've had a look at your group and everything you guys are already doing really well on social media so I don't think you need me to tell you how that works um, but I should at least just mention our Facebook page uh, so uh, with this uh, pretty standard sort of stuff really just um, yeah, information about us and sort of little news things, promotional stuff. I really do like, um, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but um, recording videos from the International Space Station, especially when it passes over New Zealand, and, and, and these are really popular, so I like to grab them. Uh, this was a really beautiful one. You might be able to see you guys um, there shortly if you can see that at all. Um, but anyway, the Facebook stuff is a fairly standard sort of a Facebook page. Um, I do have a YouTube channel. I have to be honest with you, uh, it has not really fired very well. Uh, I really struggled to get some traction with this. I had a show going in uh, 2019 called Space Dave Live, and it was very popular amongst a very small group of people. Um, but uh, I, I would love to get back into doing that. Uh, if you'd like to encourage me, what you need to do is go and subscribe. And that will give me some motivation to try and get that going again, because it's, it's a really useful channel. And um, we were doing some really cool interactive things where people could actually join in and do it live. So I really enjoy doing that sort of stuff. Um, you can also find us on um, Instagram and Twitter. But uh, to be honest, I haven't really been doing what I should have been doing on those channels. I, I have to say, to be honest, I have failed a little bit on the social media side of things in the last couple of years. I should have been doing better. But part of that is because I've been uh, concentrating on these other avenues. So the next thing um, I'll talk a little bit more about is uh, the Zoom sessions. Now, going uh, back quite a few years now, well before COVID, I have uh, tried a number of times um, to do experimental remote sessions with schools in New Zealand. So for the schools that uh, can't physically travel to be here, um, we do an online session. This was going back before Zoom. Um, it, it never really fired that much, but the schools I did it with liked it. So I decided to set that up and do um, Zoom sessions with schools instead of the field trips. Um, immediately, I found that New Zealand schools just weren't really into it. And I think that's mainly because we weren't expecting and didn't have a long lockdown. So New Zealand schools, in my experience, have just not really embraced uh, doing online remote learning that much. But overseas schools were all over it. And so what I did was I ended up um, having a lot of customers overseas. So this is a picture that a teacher sent me after one of the um, sessions that I did. Um, so it's just a, it's a typical classroom. They've got the big screen up in front of them. Most classrooms have them these days. So I just log into the classroom via Zoom in exactly the same way that I'm doing right now. And we run a session uh, virtually. And it has been um, a lot of fun um, and, and really interesting, fascinating, um, quite hard work. Um, in the first year that I was doing this, I was doing about four or five Zoom sessions a day. Um, and most of them were in the UK with um, a handful in the United States as well. And as you can imagine, that meant that I had to do them in the middle of the night. So I was actually working night shift for uh, quite a while, especially in um, 2020. Um, and it, it was very challenging and very hard work, but enormously rewarding. And some of them really, really uh, got right into it. This, this was a school where they all got dressed up with their helmets and they did a big reveal thing for me when I came online They showed me all the helmets. It was absolutely oh, awesome. It, it's so awesome, isn't it? Um, and um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's just been so good. And um, well, I think what happened was in the um, early days, um, the schools and everyone, um, businesses and everyone, of course, were trying to adapt to this new way of doing it online. But because I had had previous experience doing this, I could get in really quickly before anyone else was doing it. So just the fact that I was offering some sort of educational experience that was a bit different, a bit unique, um, they, they were all over it. Um, it, it took a while. Um, for, for the schools to sort of get used to it and get the technology going, but it did work really, really well. Um, so um, what happened was that basically went really well. I was really busy for about a year, 
But once the overseas schools started going back to school, um, it dropped off very quickly. And by that point, they were over having Zoom sessions. Um, so it all kind of died. And then I stopped doing it. And I haven't actually done any for a while now. But I am hoping to get back into it again now. Um, and I am finding that a lot of places are now going back to using a lot of the resources that they picked up during their lockdowns and realizing that these are still good resources and we can still do this. And the beauty of doing stuff overseas is that you've got the added advantage of the novelty of being from New Zealand. And um, uh, that is actually really quite helpful as well. So uh, if I'm doing a Zoom session overseas, uh, what would typically happen is that we, we just log in and I would do a fairly standard sort of a talk um, and then we would take questions and have a bit of discussion. That interactive part of it is quite important to me. Uh, I want to uh, see and if possible hear them as well. And we can have a bit of backwards and forwards and that helps enormously. Uh, also with uh, all the stuff that you sort of see around me here, I built up the system where um, I can theoretically go and find um, media resources, images and videos and things um, to respond to questions and talk about whatever it is that the audience wants to talk about. And that's been really, really important. Now, I'm a bit rusty because I haven't done it for a long time. Um, but let's just say, for example, uh, we're chatting away to someone and they want to talk about... Um, uh, you know, about the rings of Saturn or something like that, or what's happening on Mars, I could just go um, and have a look in my system and bring up some pictures and show them and be able to talk about it um, as they're asking questions. Uh, now, you guys will be familiar with um, a lot of the common questions you get about space. So a lot of this was uh, building a system whereby I could quickly and efficiently uh, answer questions with visuals. It makes all the difference if you can bring those visuals into it. And in fact, videos are a really important part of it. I won't play you the sound, but um, uh, this is a, a series of videos that I use a lot that just show you astronauts in space and things floating around and uh, you know, how do you go to sleep in space, how you eat in space, um, you know, the, the standard question, how do you go to the toilet in space, anyone who's ever worked at an observatory or a planetarium knows uh, what I'm talking about. So the idea is that you can interact with people and have all of these media resources uh, reasonably close at hand. Um, do you have to turn everything upside down when you're talking to the Northern Hemisphere, Glenn asks me. <laughs> well, I tell you what, actually, I'll just show you another tool that I use a lot. Um, this is, I usually refer to it as a space simulator. Some of you may recognize this program. It's called Celestia. It's an old program. And um, basically, it means that I can do things in real time. So it's a simulated view of space that I'm controlling right now. If you go back to uh, my view, I've got this joystick here and a couple of keypads here in front of me so I can do um, all of these things um, instantly. And um, we use this, I usually start off by talking about the Earth. Um, if it's a younger school, we go through the thing with days, nights, seasons, those kind of things. Um, but when you're doing overseas schools, it's really helpful here. So let's say I'm doing something in the UK. Uh, I would start off um, by uh, finding them wherever they are. Um, I can't actually see very clearly here. Where am I? I'm in America still. Where am I? I need to be around here somewhere, don't I? Um, sorry, my lights are in my face at the moment. But anyway, yeah, here we go. So I'd go in here. And of course, it would be daytime where they are. So I'd zoom in, I'd figure out where they are, uh, which school I'm talking to. And I would zoom right in and say, right, you're in London. Let's have a look at where you are right now. This is what you guys look like. Uh, if you want to find me, um, then we've got to go right around to the other side of the planet. And this is where I am right now. And then I'd zoom in and show that it's darkness for me. Um, and, and that's, um, I think that's really helpful and um, very visual and the fact that you can actually talk about it while you're doing it. Um, and we can go and have a look at anything if um, someone wants to ask a question about a particular planet or um, spaceship or something like that. Um, oh, no, I won't ask you. I'll just pick a, a planet. Let's say someone wants to ask about Saturn so we can go and have a look at Saturn and we can talk about it. We can show the rings of Saturn, what it looks like from different angles and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, this is a, a popular tool. It, it works really well. Um, and I think I've got a pretty good system for, uh, for using this. Uh, I know that there are other space simulators available, but for various reasons, I have stuck with this one. Um, so yeah, that whole thing of, um, that's a good question actually, Glenn, that you ask, because um, showing the earth is, it's a good way of talking about 
how there's no up and down in space and how we can flip it over any way and it doesn't really matter. And sometimes I would joke about how um, really we should consider the Earth to be this way up and New Zealand really should be at the top of the planet. That's how we think about it um, in New Zealand. Uh, so that, that's one of the tools that I use and together with the videos and other things, um, I think it can uh, make for a reasonably interesting um, experience for the kids or whoever I'm doing it with. It doesn't have to be schools. Uh, so that is uh, really mostly about the Zoom sessions. Uh, perhaps one other thing that I should point out, if I go back to this picture that I showed you before of this school, uh, this school is actually a school in Spain. So um, most of the schools I did, as I say, were in the UK and the States. However, I discovered that there are lots of schools in non-English speaking countries that are set up specifically to concentrate on teaching the kids English to help them be bilingual. So the whole school is kind of set up, um, you know, all the things on the walls and everything, it's, it tends to be in English, in, yeah, in English. So that was fascinating and extremely challenging. So you're trying to cheat, teach astronomy to kids who are really just learning English and you're starting to throw all of these new astronomical terms and things that they <laughs> just haven't come across at all. So very difficult to do these ones, but um, quite fascinating how many opportunities there are around the world. You don't just have to go to English speaking countries to be doing this. So um, anyway, that was the thing about um, the Zoom. Now, I'm happy to come back and talk about any of these things that I'm talking about now and answer more questions and flesh them out a bit more. But I do want to make sure that I get through um, these four things that I wanted to talk about. So that was the Zoom session. Uh, the next thing I wanted to just uh, mention reasonably briefly was um, uh, website resources. Now, uh, this is the website for the Space Center here. It's at spacecenter.nz if you want to try it. The website itself is, is mainly set up so that you can uh, find out about us and book a session here and that kind of thing. Uh, however, I do have an area of the website. If you click on the button that says resources, so in this area of the site, I've been gathering together just a bunch of material that I've been working with um, over the last decades, actually, um, and trying to sort of get it all together and um, present it in a place where you can come and do a whole lot of learning. So, for example, I'm working on um, getting a sort of a, a semi-structured uh, system where you can go through and uh, learn about space, just all the basics, you know, where everything fits together, how far away everything is, how it all works, where we fit in, um, etc. Um, I'm still working on this, it's, it's quite bitsy at the moment, but I'm slowly getting there. Um, so there's other things like space facts, images, um, uh, other bits and pieces. Uh, one of the things that, um, well, actually, I'll tell you what, before I carry on, I will point out that this section of the website has ads on it. Now, I hate that, um, but I'll be straight up, a big part of this is that I'm trying to survive here financially. So uh, putting ads on the website brings in some money and, I'm, and, and it's desperate times. So I'm putting ads on there. I am limiting it to one ad at the bottom of each page to try and minimize uh, the annoyance, uh, but it does have ads on them. Uh, but anyway, um, I've got a, a frequently asked questions or, or FAQ section here. Uh, so there's two prongs to this particular approach. Um, one is that people can just Google stuff and they find these pages through Google and they can, um, and they'll come across one of these pages um, and it'll give them an answer to whatever question they're asking. Um, so that's hopefully helpful, it's useful, brings in a little bit of money for me. But the other thing is, um, it's all about making everything that I do more efficient. So when you're dealing with lots and lots of people, if you're doing um, half a dozen sessions in one day and you're doing stuff on social media, you guys have probably come across this, you're getting lots and lots of questions um, and lots of them will be the same. So the idea is I'm trying to build up a repository of answers here. So instead of having to answer every single question individually, I can just um, uh, point them straight to the particular uh, web page. Now, I'd love it if anyone else wants to use any of these resources, and I would certainly appreciate any feedback or suggestions um, or content, for that matter. If anyone wants to write out any questions and answers that I could add to the website, that would be uh, very cool. So this is kind of a thing that I've got almost in the background there that I'm building it up as I can so that with the other work I'm doing, I can use that to help um, everything just flow a little bit better. Uh, so 
that's probably all I really need to say about the resources um, section on this website. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else that I really need to say there. You can go and check it out yourself if you like. And, um, but I want to get onto the thing that I'm going to talk mostly about here. I hope I've still got plenty of time. How's my time going? Still, still all good? I, I, we've got plenty of time, haven't we? Yeah, plenty of time. Okay, uh, good, because the next thing I want to spend a bit of time on. Um, so uh, the next thing goes back to the live feeds that I was talking about before. So let me show you another um, image just of, um, it's one of the corners down in the back room here. Um, so these are examples of some of the screens that I've got showing uh, what, what I refer to as live feeds. Um, so they, these are generally the latest images. It might be an actual live video stream. It could be a, a data visualization. It could be a daily summary of something, just whatever. It's just all this latest information that's coming in. And I have found this stuff to be enormously helpful and surprisingly popular. As you're moving around here during the day, uh, you often hear uh, comments like, oh, wow, look at this. This is happening right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is live. Wow. And um, people are really taken with that idea. Now, you can show someone a picture from um, a solar observatory and say, this is a picture of the sun. They'll be interested in that. But if it's an actual live picture of what the sun's doing right now, suddenly that changes everything. And I found that that really prompts a lot of questions and, um, and really good quality learning. So uh, I love the idea of these live feeds. I've been into this myself for many, many years. I've always enjoyed setting up things. But look, basically, I'm just, I'm a nerd like all you guys are. And I love sitting at my control panel and pretending I'm on a spaceship with all of the stuff all around me, like I'm whizzing through the galaxy and I'm just seeing what's happening here and there and uh, using my joystick to fly around places. Uh, I love this sort of stuff. Um, and I'm obviously really happy to be sharing it. But it did strike me that these live feeds, there's a lot of potential in here. Now, a common question I get um, as people are leaving, they say, oh, these live feeds you've got around here. Can anyone see them? How do you get them? Can I go and have a look at them myself? Now, um, you guys, um, will, a lot of you guys here will be sort of familiar with how this stuff works. You might even recognize um, some of the things that you uh, see on these screens here. Uh, the short answer is yes, most of the stuff, probably at least 80% of the live feeds I've got here, you can find yourself um, online. However, you've got to go to a whole bunch of different websites to find them. Uh, and it's often not presented that well, uh, and it, it can be quite difficult. If you just go to nasa.gov, you're not going to see this stuff. You're going to have to go to, well, let's say you want uh, some latest images of the Earth. You'll have to go to the NASA's Earth Sciences website, um, but that's just going to show you NASA's stuff. It's not going to show you the European Space Agency or you know, the Copernicus images or anything like that. You'd have to go over to the ESA website to see them. If you want to um, find out what rockets are launching, um, well, there are plenty of websites that do that, um, but they will tend to focus on rocket launches. You're not really going to see anything else. So one of the things I really wanted to do was to build one system where you could see as much of this kind of stuff as possible all in one place. Now, I actually had to do that more or less anyway. When I was building um, the system to do all of this here, I really wanted a system that could uh, efficiently and automatically be bringing in these live feeds, processing them as I wanted them to. Um, and that involves things like uh, collecting up images and automatically making videos on the fly and, and lots of things like that, and then presenting it in a consistent way. Um, so it's been quite a challenge, but I've really enjoyed doing it. Um, and since COVID, uh, well, actually, sorry, going back before COVID, this is an old idea. Um, let's get to the point here. Um, I have, uh, I, I'm working on this new website that I'm going to show you right now. This is what, what it looks like. And I'm calling this Space Dave's Universe Monitor. And you can find it uh, at universemonitor.com. Okay, you can go there right now if you want to, if you've got a spare device or something, or you can look it up later. Universe Monitor, all word. Com. So uh, you can see it on any uh, sized screen. Um, let me just, um, I'll bring up a, another view here if I can. Um, uh, yeah, this one. So what you're seeing here is the default desktop view. 
Um, and this is a more sort of what it would look like on a mobile phone. So you, you sort of have to scroll up and down a little bit more. Um, so it should work on any screen size, some better than others. But the point of this is to try and get all of these different things all in one place so that uh, anyone can go and use it. Now, I imagine the target market for this being divided into two areas. Uh, first of all, it's just anyone who's got an interest in this and, and who wants to keep um, an eye on what's happening in space. So just the general public with an interest in space. Uh, and that's what I've been concentrating on uh, for the most part. I'm also keen to make this uh, system available to anyone like me who wants to make a public display. So um, I'm talking about um, science museums, observatories, planetariums, schools, anyone else who wants any kind of public display. Now, so far it's not quite set up uh, for those people, but um, I am working on it to make it a bit easier to um, for, for those organizations to use these things as well. So um, if you'll bear with me, I would like to uh, quickly go through what I've got here and just sort of quickly talk about um, the, the main parts of this website. Um, so it's made of six panels. Um, the, the top three are the important ones. Uh, and each panel is sort of a different area of interest. And with each one, you can sort of uh, dig more into it. So um, I'll start with um, the top left panel, um, which is really the foundation of this project. It's the live feeds panel. Uh, each of these images that you can see here, um, each of these thumbnail images is, um, it represents that feed. So these are what I call pseudo live images. Each of these images is um, a screen grab from that feed that's usually been taken within the last uh, minute or so. So you can click on any one of them and um, you will get an image. Um, in this case, we're looking at um, an image of the earth that has been built up over the last 24 hours. Um, so you've got the main image there, uh, below it a bit of an explanation uh, with links to more information. So this particular image is coming from a satellite called the, um, well, I'll tell you what, let's uh, click on it. So we click on this one and it will give you more information about that satellite. This is a Suomi NNP satellite. Um, so you could find out uh, more about the, um, uh, about the instruments that are taking it um, and just more, yeah. It's a fairly self-explanatory. Um, and then there's some links to related feeds down below it. Now, by default, the system will show you a sort of a medium resolution image, but you can change the images to higher resolution uh, depending on your device and that sort of thing. So uh, each of the, the feeds um, is, whoopsie, sort of um, has that basic format. You click on it and, um, you know, let me just go back to the home page. Um, yeah, and it will show you a picture or an image of something. Let's, um, what's happened to my sun image? Let's click on there to see what's going on. Ooh, that doesn't look very good. It should be showing us a picture of the sun. Never mind, I'll sort that one out later. I wonder Maybe if we... it's not Tom there. <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> nice. Uh, let's have a... Well, actually, this will be coming from the same place. Yeah, okay, so anyway, um, so here's an image of the sun. Uh, this particular one is coming from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. You're seeing an image there. These images from the SDO, or Solar Dynamics Observatory, come in every 15 minutes, which is um, essentially real time for the sun. And in this particular case, you can also click on a video, and it will show you the last seven days up until sometime in the last 15 minutes. Uh, you can uh, full screen on the um, videos and images and stuff uh, to see closer views of it. Um, that's interesting that we are not seeing um, that one there. It's um, 171 angstrom and that's actually the first time I have seen it. Oh, there is an image there. So obviously we have lost that image, but sometime within the next 15 minutes, the next image will come in and you should see it again. So uh, anyway, you sort of get the idea there of how these um, different feeds work. You click on them and you can see what's happening. There are different types of feeds. Uh, some of them are still images, uh, videos. Um, uh, let's have a look at a, a different sort. So this one here, um, the Enlil um, uh, space weather, the solar wind representation. Some of you will be familiar with this. So this is showing uh, the sun in the middle, the earth out to the right there. And if you click on uh, the video for this one, it will show you the solar wind conditions um, sort of for the last few days and the forecast for the next few days. So um, 
yeah, the, the, all of these things, of course, are coming from different places. Uh, even with the sun, uh, you're getting them from different observatories. And normally, you would have to go to the Solar Dynamics Observatory website to see their images. If you wanted to see images from the SOHO Observatory, you're off to a different website somewhere else. But the idea here um, is that you can see them all at once. I, I must quickly show you this one. Uh, this is something that I'm quite proud of. This is uh, where I'm getting images in from both SDO and the SOHO Observatory. The SOHO is the two coronagraph images at the bottom right here. So these are coming from a different um, telescope in space to all the rest of it. Then we've got an image that uh, shows you the magnetic fields on the sun. That's the sort of, it's coming from the SDO as well, but that's coming from a different source. Someone actually makes that manually. Um, and I'm quite pleased with myself because um, so far I have not yet found anywhere on the internet that will do this. And that is to uh, display those different images all at once in the same place, synchronized with each other. You can't even do that on the SDO website. You can go there and you can see all the different images, but they won't be synchronized. So you're looking at the different images showing different wavelengths and different views of the sun, but they're all over the place. Um, you want to see them all synchronized together, don't you? So um, uh, that was a lot of work doing that one. Many sleepless nights there. So anyway, I'm starting to waffle. I've got to be careful here and uh, make sure I get through the stuff. So that shows you um, some of the live feeds. Just below it, you can see a few buttons here. And this shows you more feeds in the different categories. So if you click on the different Earth icon, um, you'll get all the feeds that we have related to um, Earth and Earth science. Uh, if you click on the sun icon, this will show you all of the different images. Look, see what's happening. This is bad timing. This is very upsetting. So obviously, um, the AIA instrument, isn't it, on the Solar Dynamics Observatory, all of the images from that instrument are missing. So we're just going to have to wait until it catches up again. That's very unusual. Those ones are usually um, very reliable, actually. They come in basically every 15 minutes. There's a whole story behind that, actually. Uh, so anyway, those are the sun images. Um, we've got uh, some space flight related feeds here. Again, the um, live feeds from the International Space Station. Um, don't really have a lot in this section, actually. I'd like to have some more here. Um, quite a few of the SpaceX facilities. Um, so we can see what's going on over at SpaceX. It's, it's nighttime there, of course. Um, and also NASA TV, um, ESA TV and whatnot. Uh, if you want to track the orbit of a particular satellite, you can uh, go here and um, this is coming in from a, a different website again. This one takes a, a little longer to load, but this shows you, for example, um, where the Hubble Space Telescope is right now. Uh, so anyway, it's all a little bit of fun there. There's one last category of uh, feeds in here. This is just an interest one, really. You don't get much science out of this one. Um, these are all webcam feeds of various observatories around the world. Now, I should point out that we don't have any feeds looking through a telescope, not at this stage. Uh, that's a whole different drama that I haven't even thought about tackling yet. Um, I would like to at some stage, but what we are seeing here is just webcams of the environment. This one looks pretty good at the moment. This is the very large telescope. Um, oh, you can see their uh, adaptive optics laser going there at the moment. This is a panoramic view. Of course, that's why the laser beam looks like it's bent. Um, but these are quite fascinating. I, I just actually really like having all of these webcam feeds just sitting there. It kind of gives you a feeling of connection with all the observatories around the world. These are usually still images that are typically updated about every five to 15 minutes. So this is um, what's happening at the Very Large Telescope right now. Um, and on some of these feeds at nighttime, you can see some really quite nice views of the sky. I think I can see the large um, Magellanic Cloud over there at the moment. You can see the Milky Way over here. Um, so there, there are some uh, beautiful feeds coming in here. These were a right pain to do. I've got to tell you, the um, observatory feeds were very, very challenging to do. And you've got to do all the permissions from each one individually. And each one uh, provides them with a, a different uh, format and everything. It's quite nightmarish to get it all together. Um, but uh, still really, really cool. You can see some great images. Uh, you might notice that a lot of the feeds have the, um, a map down the bottom that shows you uh, the Terminator, the day and night, what, what where's day and night at the moment with a little red dot. So if it's a place on earth, it'll show you where it is and um, if it's in uh, day or night right now. Um, so that's um, most of the observatory feeds there. 
um, which really uh, is pretty much what all the live feeds are about. Now, let me just, ah, uh, let me just have, tackle a couple of questions here. Now, uh, James has asked, do I have earth.nullschool.net? Uh, the answer is unfortunately no at the moment, um, simply because I haven't gone through the whole process of getting permissions for that one yet. I am definitely hoping to bring it in, um, but there are also a couple of technical issues with that one. Embedding uh, that website in the system is a little problematic. I am hoping to work through it. If any of you have not seen it, earth.nullschool.net. James has put it up in the um, uh in the chat there it's an outstanding website and it's um it's really worth doing and i certainly hope that i can bring that one in because well the best thing about that one it's very dynamic isn't it it's um it shows you actual wind movements and currents moving and everything so um, it's a fantastic one um, oh, and thanks for putting the link up to the website um well i think that's all the questions we've got at the moment so um i want to let's carry on with this, but... anyone if you've got questions uh, just pop them in the chat. Um, otherwise, yeah, keep keep it to the end. It's up to you. Okay. Normally, I get more questions than this, so I'm not actually used to talking this long without someone interrupting me. Uh, but I'm happy to keep going. I'll just blah blah all night long. So um, hopefully, you guys can stick with it. Oh, look, we've even increased our uh, audience by a couple, so we're not dropping too many off. Good stuff. You guys are staying with it. Thank you. Now, that's the main thing with the live feeds panel. And uh, as I say, that was sort of the foundation of this whole project. I went and wanted to get these live feeds in the same place. Um, so I, I would really appreciate any feedback from anyone about how well this stuff is working. Um, suggestions like James's suggestion. Have I tried this website? Have I got the source? Um, there's a lot of sources out there. There'll be lots of sources that I don't even know about yet. Um, I spend a lot of time hunting around for them. Um, but there's, there's so many resources out there. Uh, let me talk about the next panel, the um, launch schedule panel. Um, so this has actually turned out to be quite popular. When I first added this, um, I just sort of threw it in there because I might as well. Um, but I'm actually getting quite a bit of search engine traffic on this one, surprisingly. So because it is a competitive field. Now, many of you will have an app or a favorite website um, that um, deals in um, uh, upcoming launches and things. And I don't think we're really offering anything too out of the ordinary here. But essentially on this panel, you can see what launch is coming up next. It'll tell you uh, when it's going to launch in your local time zone. That's really important. I've really tried hard with this whole website to um, uh, try and detect your local time zone and uh, make sure that times are um, useful for you. Too many space websites will only do at UTC time or their local time, and you've got to try and figure it out. So anyway, you can see that our next launch coming up is a SpaceX launch. You've got a countdown here. It's in 10 hours. Uh, there are some other launches coming up here. Uh, you can click on any launch, and it will give you more information about that launch and you can watch the live uh, video feed of it. So um, SpaceX will uh, typically make their live feed available many hours before, but they don't actually go live yet. So you can see that this one is going to go live in 10 hours, but you get the basic information, a summary of what's going to happen. Uh, there are more links down here. So for example, um, you can uh, click the link to learn more about this particular launch vehicle. Um, so uh, yeah, that's uh, basically how oh, you get the weather forecast and that kind of thing. So uh, click on any launch to find out more about it. Uh, you can click on upcoming to see a longer list of the next 20 launches that are coming up with more information about any of those. Uh, or if you want to, you can uh, search the launch database and uh, it will show you pretty much any launch. At the moment, I'm going back, uh, they're going back to about 2016 and I've got uh, all the upcoming launches that uh, we know about, hopefully. So you can actually search here. You won't be able to see the writing here. Don't worry about that. But I'm using a drop menu here. Let's say that we want to see uh, Rocket Lab launches. So we just click on Rocket Lab and I want to see what launches they've got coming up. So I can click on this and this will give me a list of all the upcoming rocket launches. Or I might um, prefer to go back and have a look at all the past rocket launches by Rocket Lab. And I can go down here and... Um, uh, click on any one of them, I'll click on this one, and it's still got the launch video there, so you can go back and you can watch all the previous launch videos as well. So um, we've got, I, I'm not actually sure how many in the database uh, at the moment, but there's quite a few hundred launches in the uh, database currently. So that is mainly what the um, launch panel is all about, uh, fairly self-explanatory. 
Uh, the rest of it, we can just sort of whiz through this uh, more quickly, really. The news panel, now these um, news headlines here are simply links to other websites. I'm not really in the business of writing news stories myself, uh, but I decided it was worth doing this. So th the news part of it, the system here is that um, it automatically um, brings in the latest news stories from about a dozen or so different news websites. You'll be familiar with a lot of these, uh, space.com, Universe Today, Space Flight Now, et cetera, uh, NASA press releases and whatnot. Uh, so what it does is that every couple of hours it updates and just shows you a list of uh, all the latest news stories. Now, even if you're not interested in list and, uh, reading all of the stories, I find it a really useful way to just make sure that you're up to date with everything that's happening. Um, every morning I get up and before I get my lazy butt out of bed, I just have a quick look through and uh, see what's happening um, in the world of space. Uh, so if you do click on these links, just be aware it's taking you to another website then bringing you uh, back to this one. And you can see down the left there are uh, the logos. So if you're familiar with those websites, you can um, pick which ones you might want to go to. I will just quickly pick, click on more news there and show you that in this section, uh, you can see more of the same, including um, latest videos from various uh, news sources and agencies and whatnot. So these are really just um, links to, oh, let's just click on one of the Kennedy Space Center. So it will just take you to the latest video that Kennedy Space Center has put out. Um, and there are a few other bits and pieces in the news section there. Uh, the other panels we don't really need to talk too much about, to be honest, they're sort of padding panels, really. The image of the day uh, at the moment relies very heavily on NASA's image of the day, simply because that's the easiest one to deal with the copyright issues. Um, I'd love to bring in the APOD, the astronomy image of the day here, but that's more complex because of the copyright issues. Some of the, uh, some of the images are copyright, some aren't, but I do have a plan to be able to pull out because it's all got to be automated. Um, I've got to be able to go on holiday and this thing keeps working without me. Uh, so um, I, I do have a plan. But anyway, you can go through and see previous images of the day. It's, it's usually something that's sort of reasonably current or relevant. Um, and the random fact panel um, pulls something from the database within this website. Uh, so the um, links that I clicked on before that show you more information about something, uh, this is built on that system. So at the moment, oh, this isn't probably a great one, but uh, this is just showing you a bit about Aristarchus. Um, actually, sorry, th this one is an example of uh, information that I've got uh, in the space center here. So a lot of the display panels, I've got an astronomy wall of fame here. So I'm in the process of taking all the stuff that I've already made there um, and just bringing it in to be part of uh, this app as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can just click on the button down here and it will give you a new random fact and uh, you just click on the links if you want more information. Uh, the last panel there is just housekeeping, so we don't need to worry about that. That's well, there is well, one, one thing I'd like to draw attention to. If uh, you'd like to support Dave, go to that panel and click on the little link that says Patreon in the bottom left hand side there. Um, you can help support him with sort of dollar a month and bottom tier goes up five dollars, ten dollars. And you know, if you're on the ten dollar level, uh, you get free entry for into the center and a whole lot of other goodies. So, not a lot of money, and it's going for a very, very good cause, I think. So, uh, back to you, Dave. Thank you so much for that, James. Um, I, look, that should be the first thing I say to people and the last thing, isn't it? I'm absolutely terrible at promoting my own methods of income, which is just <laughs> kind of defeats the purpose in a way. But anyway, um, yeah, thank you for that. The, the Patreon thing, it, if you don't want to join Patreon, but you would still like to um, donate or help out in some way, you, you don't have to use Patreon, but it is the, the one that works. It's, it's really, it's, it's the easiest and most efficient for me. So um, what Patreon does is that it helps set up um, some sort of regular income so that uh, people like me can undertake projects with just a little bit more confidence because you are unlikely to lose all your supporters in a couple of months, uh, but it means that you can plan a little bit better and it really does make all the difference. And uh, like James says, it, it only needs to be, a, a, I think actually the minimum might be five on Patreon. Um, That's a dollar, I've got it to the oh, red. It is a dollar, off. okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, all of that helps. Um, you know, if we could get a thousand people giving a dollar a month, well, that actually changes things for me. It means that I can invest more money into this and keep it going. Now, this is um, 
frighteningly expensive, unfortunately. I've actually taken, I'll, I'll tell you, I've taken a big risk on this um, universe monitor uh, thing because this website requires an entire web server all to itself. Um, there's, I use Amazon Web Services for anyone who's interested. Sorry for those of you who hate Amazon, but um, it was just the way it went. Um, but because there's so much processing going on in the background, there's constant um, ingesting and processing images and everything. It's really hard on the web server and there's a lot of software just running 24 seven the whole time. So I actually had to get a quite a high end server just for this website. So um, any money at all that would, um, would help keep this going. And I'm not just talking about that project either, just the whole thing that we're doing here at the Space Center. If you want to help out at all, uh, we would really appreciate any support at all. And, and I, sorry, I've added the, the Patreon link in the chat as well, if you're interested. Uh, just pop into the chat and um, yeah, the launch the page is pretty self uh, self-explanatory and straightforward so i don't think anyone will have a problem there if you do let me know I, I, if you have a problem with it or any concerns if anything puts you off please let me know because i need to know about it um, thank you again so much for that james um, so um, i'm just aware that our time is really getting on here and i have covered um, the main things that i wanted to here uh, so um, if, if you've got questions Now's the time to be firing them at me. Um, and it can be about anything, the Space Center, um, any of these projects, um, uh, or anything at all. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk about anything to do with space. Um, but um, oh, what was I going to say there? Oh, I had something else in my thought, but it has escaped. Oh, I, I know what I was going to say. Um, as I mentioned, that everything that I've been talking about here, really, to be honest, um, the main thrust of these projects has been to help uh, bail myself out of a very difficult financial situation. But obviously the point here is to make things that are uh, interesting and hopefully useful and helpful for other people. So uh, I really do need feedback on everything that I'm doing here. Um, please feel free to use any of these resources in any way that you can. If you are interested or know someone that might be interested in having the educational Zoom sessions, uh, just get hold of me. Um, because I, I really would like to get the Zoom sessions going with New Zealand schools so I don't have to get up in the middle of the night, so I don't have to be doing night shift. I don't mind doing it occasionally, but full time, it's a bit difficult. To be honest, I have found that the New Zealand schools have actually been pretty blooming slow and frankly, quite useless at um, getting online. Um, it's been a bit disappointing for me. I think New Zealand schools uh, really, frankly, should be doing a bit better. Um, but anyway, um, uh, that option's there. Now, with the Universe Monitor project, like I said uh, before, one of the things that I really want to do is to make the system available for facilities such as observatories and planetariums to be able to use to make displays. Now, uh, we have tried occasionally at Hamilton Observatory to, to put up displays there. We, we, we have still, it, it comes and goes, doesn't it, Ian? Uh, for those of you who haven't met Ian um, from Hamilton Observatory, he's here. Um, and I've seen Ian use um, these displays, um, not my ones, but the um, things like the live feed from the space station stuff, I've seen Ian using them in his displays up on the screen. Um, and I think it works really well. So if you've got any ideas for having a screen display at your facility, or you might want to do it at home, you might be like me and you want to set up a spaceship console in, um, in your man cave or your um, outside room or something like that. Um, I've got all sorts of ideas about how that works. It's, it's a lot of fun. So the system itself at the moment isn't really intuitive for setting up a public display. Um, but if you've got any ideas, if you, for example, you would like to set up some sort of display related to the space station or uh, what's happening with the sun or the moon phase or anything at all, um, and you'd say, hey, I'd like to have a screen that showed this, this, and this. Is that possible? Please get hold of me. I'd love to see if we can work something out that we could build into the system for all you guys to use. Um, okay, um, I'm just quickly looking at the, um, at the chat here. Let me just have a look. I think there's a couple of questions there. Do you plan on having any sort of tracking uh, of satellites or the moon? Um, so with the, there is... Um, uh, one system in here, it's, it's a bit hidden at the moment, to be honest, but if, um, if we have a look in the, um, sorry, let me get all, got too many mice going here, why isn't this mouse working? Uh-oh, I've got a flat battery in my mouse. Oh no, here we go. 
so let me think. If we have a look in the um, in the space flight one, there's um, you can see down here satellite orbit tracking map. So you've clicked on um, the space flight feeds, um, and if you click on that one, there are a bunch of satellites here. Now these are um, yeah. Let, let's just click on any of them. Actually, um, tell you what, let's click on the Solar Dynamics Observatory because this is a fascinating one. Have a look at this orbit. I don't, know if any, if you, I don't know how well you can see that. Let me just zoom in on a little bit. Um, that um, shape that you've got there is the footprint of the Solar Dynamics Observatory. That is showing its orbit around the Earth. It's weird, isn't it? If you haven't come across this kind of thing before, I'm going to leave that as a homework exercise for you to figure out how on Earth a satellite can have an orbit that looks like that. Okay, there you go. That's something for you to work on before if you have no idea how that works. Took me a while to figure it out, I have to admit. Uh, but anyway, uh, the point was that on this page that we do have um, a bunch of different um, uh, orbits, uh, satellite tracking, but it is just showing you that view. So it's um, actually these ones do usually have, it will show you the next pass. Now, like many of the feeds here, this is coming, well, like most of the feeds, to be honest, it's coming from a third party provider. This one is coming from a website called n2yo.com. A lot of you will have come across this website. It's a popular, well known website that deals in satellite tracking. And so we're just embedding this um, into our system to keep it all in the same place. You can go to their website and see the same thing, of course. Um, hopefully, that kind of answers your question there. Um, like all of these things, I'm open to suggestions and um, I've got ideas for things in the future, such as push notifications. You might want to be told when the ISS is coming overhead. I don't have that as part of the system at the moment, but hopefully at some stage I will. Uh, anyway, um, Glenn's just saying thank you. Thank you, Glenn, if you're still here. Um, oh, yes, Glenn um, was a customer, actually, <laughs> who came in uh, to the Space Centre recently. So if you're still there, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us today. It was wonderful having you guys here. Um, oh, and you've been busy promoting the Space Center, you beautiful thing. Thank you. Uh, now, Paul's saying, um, do you know do you know the uh, program Orbiter and Space Engine? Yes. Now, um, for anyone who missed it, that is going back to uh, the space simulator that I'm using. And I'm using, uh, I've mentioned that this is a very old program. It's called Celestia. It's an open source um, software program, and I am using a modified version of this, so it's open source, so I have modified this myself to do the sort of things that I want it to be able to do, um, and that is the main reason that I haven't used those other ones. I like a space engine a lot. It's frankly, it's nicer and works more smoothly than this, but it doesn't have the same options to be able to um, work with the code yourself. And I need to be able to do that. I need to be able to create physical keypads um, to be able to do things. And unfortunately, uh, there are some problems with those programs doing that. At least there were last time I checked. I should go and have another look. So um, thank you very much for that. That's exactly the kind of suggestions that I'm looking for. Um, and you have reminded me, I will go and check those programs out to see if um, they would be uh, suitable. I worry about the Celestia one that I'm using because um, it is quite old now. If there's any program uh, programmers out there, it's an old program. It's, it must be close to 20 years old. It's, it's single threading and it's, it doesn't really uh, keep up with um, modern computers that well, but it does work well for my uh, purposes. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. So this is your last chance. It's, it's getting on now. It's 10 to nine. So you guys have sat through um, a long session there. Um, uh, perhaps right now, I will just take the chance to say uh, thank you so much, everyone, for um, joining in tonight. I hope you got something out of this, at least. Uh, um, uh, at least something interesting, if not um, actually generally useful for you, um, and would really appreciate any feedback that you uh, might have on anything that I've talked about here. Thank you um, to Hibiscus Coast um, Astronomical Society. It's been um, really cool being part of uh, your session tonight and seeing what you guys are up to, and um, thanks for being part of it. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you, Dave, uh, for, for this. It's been absolutely amazing, especially for me. Um, what you are doing is what I was working on probably 10, 15 years ago. And eventually I gave up because it was just too difficult back then, um, you know, especially creating like the universe monitor. I was doing a, a similar sort of thing uh, on a, a, another web page, but yeah, it ended up being too taxing back then. But you know, with advances in uh, technology and uh, 
bit of know-how and cleverness. I think you've got an excellent system here. I will, I will definitely be using this um, and probably chatting to you about how we could utilize this maybe down in uh, so at Stonehenge or something like that at some point. So I, th I think it would be really, really good. And uh, Chris is saying he's now Patreon. I'm a Patreon. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how many others are. So um, yeah, carry on with the good work there, Dave. <laughs> we really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, all the best to you guys as well. I, I see the work that you're doing. Um, and, um, you know, I'm really looking forward. Hopefully we can do more work together. I would, I would really love to do that. I'm sure we will, because, uh, you know, as part of the Hibiscus Coast Astronomical Society, one of our main aims is education, uh, particularly, um, you know, to reach out to uh, the school kids uh, locally. Uh, we've got a very big dream of having our own observatory and education centre as well one day. So pretty similar to what you've got going there. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, you definitely pioneering the way for the rest of us. And uh, thanks very much for doing that. So any other last questions there? Uh, you can just talk as well if you unmute yourself or in the chat. No. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, uh, if you want to keep up with uh, our uh, Zoom meetings uh, going forward, uh, we will be carrying on with them until we get our venue sorted out again. Um, we will let you know as soon as we have uh, news on that front. I know the you know, people scurrying around in the background who've been doing a lot of work in, in finding the new venue and uh, that, and uh, you know, thanks to them as well. But in the meantime, this is where we are for the moment, and uh, just keep an eye on our Facebook page um, or even on the Resins in, uh, Education group on Facebook as well. And yeah, I, I suggest also uh, have a look at uh, Dave's uh, Facebook page as well. Um, I think I put that into the on my Facebook links. So go and have a look there. Um, I will probably do a link up again to uh, Universe Monitor on our Facebook page. Um, so yeah, not not going going to happen. <laughs> so thank thank you all and uh, have a very good evening. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, everyone. Dave. Thank you for that very inspiring talk. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. And for what it. you're doing, for all the kids out there. Thank oh, you. Fantastic. Yeah. You too. You too. I appreciate thank everything you. you guys are doing too. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Oh, that was good. Good and uh, good Good numbers. And uh, boy, that was pretty, uh, pretty inspiring what he's doing, isn't it? Oh, it's absolutely amazing. Wow. Um, you know, I was told it was good, but I didn't realize it was this good. <laughs> yeah. You know, his commitment to educating young people. And I, I think that's one of the greatest things you can do. It's the, it's the um, best weapon against all the bad crap that's going on in the world is education of our youth. Yeah. You know, it was quite funny because, um, you know, th this is what I was doing down in Wellington before, you know, I moved up here. Um, at Stonehenge. Um, in fact, uh, you know, a couple of times um, you know, for uh, star parties and that, um, I donated a, a big TV screen to them and I uh, hooked up a whole thing so that could, people could see the, the live view of the ISS um, along with the tracking. I did it on a separate screen. Um, and of course, being in ham radio, I have access to some of the the chit chat that goes on up there as well. So as it came over, they could hear astronauts talking as well as see where it is, you know, visually see where it is as well as on the map. And it was amazing. And I thought, now, this is what we really need to do down there. And then um, doing everything with the, the solar, live solar feeds and things like that. Um, you know, the, the downside there was just no internet connection down there. Um, so, you know, a lot of the things we, we just could not do at that point. But, you know, with things like Starlink and um, that now, it's, it's 
getting more feasible. Mm. Do you see the Starlink? I'll, I'll actually stop the recording now. Should I do? Yeah. Yes. Um, here it is. Stop recording.